The first part of any basic workflow starts with your camera and your gear. Before you ever take a single image, you need to know how your images are going to be used. For example, if you plan on printing a billboard, you'll have very different camera requirements than if you plan on only printing 4x6 photos. You'll also want to consider your camera settings. For example, one of the biggest decisions you have to make with your digital camera is shooting in RAW or JPEG. Depending on what you choose, your post-processing is going to be very different. Remember, when you shoot in JPEG, then the camera is already doing some of the post-processing work for you. That means that camera settings such as white balance, color space, lens corrections, other things like that, those all affect the final image. They essentially get baked into the image that comes out of your camera. Whereas if you're shooting RAW, those settings in your camera affect how it looks on the back of your screen, but once you import them into your post-processing software, all of those can actually be changed and affected and are not set in stone. There are other camera settings that can have a big impact on your workflow. For example, something as simple as setting the correct date and time in your camera is really important so that when you look back at a photo in the future, you know exactly when it was taken. But it's even more important if you work with other photographers. I'm a wedding photographer and I always have at least one other photographer with me at a wedding. It's really important for us to have the exact same date and time in both of our cameras or all of our cameras so that when I import all those photos into my post-processing software, everything lines up perfectly. If their cameras are an hour off from mine, then I get some really weird stuff going on and it takes me extra time to synchronize everything, whereas it saves me a lot of time just to do it and it's an important part of my workflow just to take care of it before the wedding ever starts. You might also consider inputting your copyright and contact information directly into your camera. Once you do that, it gets embedded into every single photo that you take. Now, this is important because you, if you ever lose a memory card and someone finds it, they can pull up those photos, look at that information, and hopefully return the card to you. This is also important to workflow because that information carries over into most post-processing software. So keep in mind, while all of these camera settings might seem insignificant, they can potentially have a big impact on your overall workflow. Lastly, don't think that camera settings are the only important part of your workflow before you start taking pictures. For example, before I go to a wedding, I have a checklist that I go through to make sure that I don't forget anything. It includes charging all my batteries for both my cameras and my flashes, I format all my memory cards, I clean my lenses and my camera sensor, and I generally make sure that I have everything ready to walk out the door before it's time to go. By doing this the same way every single time, I never forget anything and I have everything that I need. Now everyone's going to have a different workflow before they go to a shoot, so just work on yours, make sure it works for you, and make sure you do it every single time. The next step in the workflow process is capturing images, and there are steps you can take here that could potentially impact your entire workflow. Take for example something as simple as a memory card. If you have a process for what to do once you take a used memory card out of your camera and put it back in its case, that can be a really big deal. Both Nassim and I, once we take a card out of our camera that has images on it, we put it into our memory card holder upside down. That means if we see any cards in there that are upside down, we know they have images on them, not to use them again until they get imported into our computers. Now what happens if this isn't part of your workflow? If you don't format your cards and you pull a random card out of your memory card holder and you stick it in your camera and format it, and those are images that you just took and don't have backed up anywhere, you've just lost all of those images. So it's super important for something as simple as this to have a step in your workflow that deals with it. How you take pictures also affects your overall workflow. Now, we already discussed the basics of taking pictures in our level one photography basics course, but keep in mind that every single time you press that shutter button, you have a decision to make. Are you under or are you overexposing your image? Are you using higher ISO or maybe are you using flash? All of these different decisions that you make during the shoot will carry over and affect your post-processing and how much time you spend doing that. For example, if you take lots of photos of the same exact thing and you're basically a spray and pray shooter taking lots of photos hoping to get one good one, that's going to really add a lot of time to your workflow because it takes a lot of time to import those images and even more time to go through and pick out the good ones. Another example is if you set your ISO way too high so that all of your images have excessive noise, then that's going to add a lot of extra time in post-processing going through 
adding noise reduction, and it could ultimately give you lower quality images. There are other things during your shoot that can affect your post-processing options, such as your camera's orientation and aspect ratio. For example, I had a client once and I photographed them head to toe in a two x three aspect ratio. Well, they came back and wanted an eight x 10 print of that, which meant I either had to chop off their head or their feet. Neither is a very good option and you can bet I learned from that mistake. So keep this in mind, as you shoot more, you'll gain experience, learn from your mistakes and streamline your workflow, which will make your life easier. At this point in the workflow, you've got your camera all set up, you've taken a bunch of pictures and now you have a memory card with images on it. Well, you wanna get the images off of the memory card and onto your computer, but what kind of computer is it gonna be? Maybe it's a PC, maybe a Mac, maybe something else. Do you want a desktop or a laptop? We're gonna talk about hardware considerations next. Now maybe you have a computer at home or maybe you're looking to buy one specifically for photography. Well right now we're gonna talk about the two most popular platforms out there which is PC and Mac. Now others might be available, but PC and Mac are the most popular and have the most software options out there. We're not trying to start a flame war, we're not trying to say which is best overall, we're just gonna give a few pros and cons purely in terms of photography. When I started in photography, I used a PC and it worked really well for me. And there's a few reasons why. First off, they're fairly inexpensive. There's so many different manufacturers out there and there's lots of different models and specifications. You're probably gonna be able to find something that works great for your needs and still fits your budget. Another great thing about PCs is they're very expandable, meaning you can add or replace hardware if you ever need to. You can also build your own great machine for a really reasonable price. One of the cons for PCs, and it's one that I experienced, is that they could have stability issues. There's a reason for that. There's so many different types of hardware out there and they all have their own drivers and firmware and software and all these different things that are coming together in one computer. Eventually, there's gonna be two things that don't play well together and that could lead to system crashes or maybe random reboots and all these different things that make it frustrating to work with. Another potential con for PCs is the operating system itself. And the reason there is the operating system has to be written to work with so many different types of hardware and software. It becomes a jack of all trades, but it's a master of none, thus leading to other potential problems. Now, because of these stability issues I experienced with my PC, when it came time to buy a new computer, I figured I'd give a Mac a try. A lot of my photographer friends used Macs. I'd go into a coffee shop and see all these other artists using Macs, so I thought, that must be what photographers need. Well, honestly, there isn't really a big difference, at least as far as the performance goes, but they do have other benefits. One of the first things I noticed about my Mac is how much more stable it seemed compared to my PC, and there's a really good reason for that. Apple engineers handpick the hardware they use inside of Macs, and for that hardware, they write the drivers and the firmware, making sure that everything plays nice together. So that means when I have driver, firmware, or even operating system updates, they all come from Apple in one package and it's a really simple upgrade procedure. Compared to a PC where I had individual downloads for everything at all different times, it's so much simpler and saves me quite a bit of time. This easy software update experience is one of the reasons that, in my opinion, Macs have a superior user experience. Another reason is something as simple as the trackpad on my laptop which is just like the one you see here. The first time I ever used it, I'd never used anything like it before. It seemed so intuitive and it worked so well. It just completely blew me away. But this doesn't mean that Macs are perfect. They do have some drawbacks of their own. For example, they're typically more expensive than PCs and this can make them cost prohibitive for some photographers. Another big drawback can be that they are not nearly as expandable as PCs are. They're pretty much a closed system and getting in and trying to change any of the hardware inside is a very involved, if not impossible procedure. So am I saying that Macs are better than PCs? No. They might work better for me, but for other photographers, a PC might work just fine or even be preferred. Nassim, for example, loves PCs. He builds his own computers, he has no problem dealing with issues as they come up, and it's just a system that he's overall comfortable with. I, on the other hand, really prefer Macs. As a business owner, I don't wanna spend time messing with computers and doing all this stuff if I don't have to, so for me, a Mac is the perfect option. In conclusion, both Macs and PCs have their own pros and cons. You'll need to take your own criteria and needs into account 
when choosing which computer works best for you. Another important decision you'll need to make when choosing a computer is whether a desktop or a laptop will work the best for you. So let's talk about desktops first. One of the primary advantages desktops have over laptops is in pure performance. They typically have much more powerful components, which means anything you try and do on them, whether it's exporting images, whether it's processing large files, creating panoramas, anything that is labor intensive on your computer is gonna be a lot faster on a desktop versus a laptop. Another great benefit to desktops is that they are expandable, and that means that if you need to add more storage, if you need to add more memory, if you need to add more powerful components, you can. Typically, laptops are limited on what you can add or change. Desktops, the sky's the limit. One more benefit for desktops is that they're always going to be in the same place. Every single day, every single week, you're going to be working in the exact same conditions, and you can control those conditions. That means if you have calibrated monitors, if you have any kind of light issues, once you get those figured out, once you get your lighting set in your work area, it should be the same every single day that you're working, which gives you really consistent results. In comparison to desktops, a laptop's primary advantage is how portable it is. With a laptop, you can take it anywhere so your work goes with you. If you want to take it with you to a shoot and go ahead and start downloading and editing videos immediately afterwards, you can do that. If you want to go on vacation, if you're going on a trip, you can take your laptop with you. You don't have to miss a beat. Just like anything else, laptops do have a downside. They're typically going to be more expensive and less powerful than a desktop. They have slower processors, less RAM, less storage space, which means that they are not going to be nearly as powerful and fast as a desktop will be. If you're willing to compromise a bit on the portability and have a heavier and larger laptop, you can always have more power. Now, many photographers choose to work with both a desktop and a laptop, giving them the best of both worlds. While they're at home, they use their desktop as their primary machine for all of their editing, but when they're on assignment, away from their home, away from their desktop, they have a laptop so they don't have any downtime and can still get work done. So you'll need to decide what's the best option for you, a desktop or a laptop. If you're just getting started, a desktop is a great option because it's typically less expensive and more powerful than a laptop and also offers a consistent editing location. But if you find yourself on the road quite a bit and away from home, a laptop is a great option just so you can get your work done while you're on the road. The more images you shoot, the more images you'll have to store. And as any experienced photographer can tell you, storage is something you always need more of. It's a very important thing to have a long-term storage strategy, so let's just talk about storage now. When I first started out in photography, I had images stored everywhere. I had them on my main hard drive, on backup hard drives, on external hard drives. I would even burn them to DVDs and CDs just so I'd have that extra little bit of storage space. The problem was I couldn't ever find anything. So consolidation of your images is very important to a simple workflow. So we're gonna talk about how you can figure out what kind of storage solutions you need. One of the first things you need to decide is how much storage space you need. If you're just starting out or you're not shooting a lot, you might think you could get, get away with a fairly small hard drive, but that's a common mistake. The reason is the more you shoot, the more it'll start to fill up. And if you buy one that's bigger than you actually need, you're not gonna run into any storage issues for quite a while. By having a larger hard drive than you actually need right now, you can develop that habit of putting everything in the same place, which makes backup, which makes finding files, which makes everything so much simpler, and it's a great habit to have for the rest of your life. The type of camera that you have and what you photograph will also greatly impact your storage needs. For example, if you have a really high resolution camera and you go out and you photograph panoramic photos that require multiple images of the same scene, you're going to use a lot of storage space. In contrast, if you have a low resolution camera and you only go take pictures personally, maybe of birthday parties or at the zoo or something, you're not gonna take up nearly as much storage space as that other high resolution camera will. Whether or not you decide to delete images will also impact how much storage you need. Some people never delete a thing and they're gonna need a lot more storage than those who occasionally purge unwanted images. With any storage type, it's not a matter of if it's going to fail, but a matter of when and all storage will eventually fail. When that happens, you potentially lose everything stored on it. Now, there's older types of storage that have moving parts inside, spinning heads and platters, and those are what are traditionally known as hard drives. Now, there's new types of storage that are much faster and much less likely to fail simply because they don't have moving parts. Technology is always changing. Today, we have SSD drives, we have PCIe flash memory, and in the future, who knows? 
Maybe we'll have faster storage that is less prone to failure. With all these different types of storage on the market today, how do you decide what's gonna work the best for you? Well, as with anything, there's always gonna be a trade-off. For example, older hard drives with moving parts are typically gonna be less expensive and have a lot more capacity than newer types of storage. The downside, though, is that they are usually a lot slower. Now, these newer types of storage are very, very fast, but they're typically gonna be more expensive and have less storage than the old hard drives. Many photographers today who work with large numbers of images will typically work with more than one type of storage. For example, they'll keep all of their images on larger hard drives and they'll keep their operating system, their photo editing software, and all the, the associated files on smaller, faster storage. Now this brings up an interesting point. If you have a huge number of images and you need a ton of storage, or us for example, we're shooting this video and video takes up enormous amounts of storage, we need a big storage solution. So one way that you can achieve that instead of using one single drive is to use multiple drives that are tied together into what's known as an array. And this array of drives all functions together as one large unit. In these storage arrays, there's different ways that the drives are grouped together, and that's known as RAID. Let me tell you a few of the most popular RAID types right now. There's RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. Without going into too much detail, there's a few differences between the different types of RAID. For example, RAID 0, if you have two hard drives, then the information is spread across both of them. So if you lose one, you lose everything. In RAID 1, your information is mirrored between the two drives. So if you lose one, you have an exact copy of everything on the other hard drive. Now RAID 0 is a very tempting option because it offers high performance and twice the capacity of RAID 1. But again, if you lose one hard drive, then you end up losing everything. RAID 1 might be a little bit slower and you have half the capacity of RAID 0, but at least your data is safe if one drive fails. If you have really big storage needs, you might consider something like RAID 5 or 10. They can use multiple drives and give you lots of options for the storage you need. One thing to note about RAID is it should never be considered as your only backup solution. In RAID 1, 5, and 10, if one drive fails, your data can still be saved. But if more than one drive fails at the same time, you can lose everything. Why would that ever, ever even happen? Well, if you buy all of your drives together, then they're much more likely to fail together as well. So just to reiterate so we're very clear, RAID is not a backup solution, it is purely a storage solution. When it comes to storage, there's internal and there's external storage. Internal is what's found inside of a computer. So this iMac, a laptop, or a desktop all have a storage device inside. And it could be one, it could be more than one. External storage is found outside of a computer. It could be something as simple as a thumb drive or a USB powered drive, or it could be a large multi-drive array like we discussed earlier. With internal drives, especially the ones that ship with your computer, they will typically be connected in the fastest way possible. With external drives, on the other hand, you have to be a little more careful because the device speed might not always match the connection speed of your computer. For example, if you have an external storage device that's USB 3.0, but your computer only has USB 2.0 ports, your computer becomes the bottleneck. It can't take advantage of the faster speeds that this device is capable of, and you're gonna have a really hard time accessing the information on it. It's just gonna be really, really slow. So always make sure that your device speed matches what your computer's capable of supporting. Another thing to consider is not just the speed of your connection, but the type of connection. Between Macs and PCs, there's lots of different types of connections available for storage devices. So always make sure that your storage device's connection is compatible with your computer. So to wrap up storage, there's three key takeaways for you. First, storage is very important and is a critical part of your workflow. Make sure that you develop good habits now by consolidating all of your images in one place and having enough storage to grow into. Second, there's lots of different types of storage out there, so it's up to you to decide what you need and what's gonna work best for you based on speed, capacity, and price. Third, make sure that the storage that you pick is compatible with your computer. Now, we have some storage suggestions and recommendations for you. This is both what Nassim and I do and what we suggest you do as well. First of all, 
If you use a program like Lightroom that generates a database that it references, you should always keep that on your fastest drive. Now, whether it's an SSD drive or a PCIe flash memory, whatever you use in your computer that's your fastest drive, keep the database there. If you have a lot of images, you'll probably want to keep those on a separate larger hard drive. Now, ideally, it would be a RAID 1 array of two drives so that if one fails, you at least have another identical drive. But if you can't afford that, at least one other drive will do. What this does is it puts this database, in this example, a Lightroom catalog, on your fastest storage available, giving you great performance. Ideally, if budget's not an issue, you could put all of your photos on fast storage as well, giving you maximum performance. At this point, you might already have a desktop or a laptop that you might want to use for photo editing. Or perhaps you're looking into buying a new machine just purely for those needs. What are the basic computing requirements? There are a number of variables you need to look into when assessing computer hardware requirements. For example, software plays a big part of it. If you run software like Lightroom or Photoshop where there's so much built-in functionality that the software itself is complex and it consumes a lot of memory and computing resources, then perhaps you need to increase your overall computing power to provide to the software so that you can have a good user experience. Another thing is the software itself might say, well, you only need say four gigabytes of or eight gigabytes of memory RAM to be able to run it. But that doesn't really mean much because from the software manufacturer standpoint, that's just for you to be able to run it. If you have a high resolution camera or you have a lot of files that you work with and you're trying to do so many things at once, you might experience extreme slowdown and overall a really bad experience. So for you to be able to keep up and make sure that the software runs smoothly, you want to at least double or sometimes even triple that requirement. Another consideration is the type of photography you do. For example, if you're a landscape photographer and you enjoy shooting panoramas, you might have single row or multi row panoramas with potentially hundreds of images. And if you try to stitch them together to create that massive panorama, you're going to need a very powerful machine. And even the most powerful machine you can buy on the market today might not suffice for those needs. Because you, another factor you need to put in place is the resolution of the camera itself. Even in this particular case, if you shoot with a low resolution camera versus a high resolution camera, the computing requirements will change drastically. For example, a 16 megapixel camera with a single row or multi-row panorama might stitch much faster and easier than say 36 or a 50 megapixel camera. So all these things like the type of software you're planning to use, the type of photography you do, and the resolution of your camera could all play a big role in shaping up your computer requirements. Now keep in mind that when looking at software specifications and then comparing them against your current computer that say you bought a few years back, then you might say, well, you know, it says 3.2 gigahertz or maybe Core i5 or Core i7 processor required and your machine might have those specifications. But it doesn't really mean much because even a few years back and today, that same 3.2 gigahertz machine is drastically different. And that same Core i5 or Core i7 processor is now so much faster. Usually you will not find in the software specifications themselves something that states specifically what generation processor or what generation memory you require to have. So that's a major pitfall for a lot of people. They look at the software and they think, well, my computer should be fast enough to be able to run it. But in reality, even three, five years, or even longer periods of time, they create a huge difference in performance itself. And that, as we previously mentioned, doesn't just get limited by the processor and the RAM speed. There's also storage. Storage could be five years ago, we had a lot of internal hard drives out there. But today, you have much faster PCIe memory, it's flash memory, so much faster than hard drives. And even SSDs are going to be three, four times faster, if not more, than the old generation hard drives. So keep all this in mind when looking at these things. You might have also noticed that in photography industry, camera resolution tends to increase drastically over time. A high resolution camera from a few years back today is considered to be a low resolution camera. And in fact, if you look at smaller devices like camera phones, for example, those might have that same resolution, which back then was considered to be super high. 
Now, I'm not trying to say that higher resolution necessarily translates to better image quality. In fact, in our level one course, we specifically stated that the sensor size plays a big role in overall image quality. However, as you increase in image resolution, which means you're, you're now shooting with higher resolution cameras, there's potentially more information in those images. And more information and more pixels do translate to higher computing requirements. So keep this in mind when looking at higher resolution cameras. You might need to upgrade your computer hardware to be able to work with those higher resolution files.